Recording in progress. Hi, Roger. Welcome to the program. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm good. I'm actually really excited about this because we're going to be talking about the Greek gods and how they were real and based on your research. And I'm always interested in kind of getting out of the our paradigms and exploring things and people to think about different, you know, just think differently and see what was really the truth. What got you into exploring this? Because it's such an interesting diversion. Well, I discovered some things on my property that I couldn't explain. They looked like human body parts, which they were, because <laughs> I had them DNA tested, because they were, they were extraordinarily large. One fingertip was three feet long. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I could show you all these things. I, I might lose you here. Hold on one second. I'm going to close that. No, we're good. <laughs> no, okay. I, I could show you. Let me just show you the fingertip I found. Okay. Um, this is Can you see my screen? No. I can't see your screen. All right, I have to go into sc screen share. Is that okay? Yep. All right. All right, it gave me a slow response. Give me one second here. Okay, now I think you can see my screen, right? Yep, I can see it. Okay, now um, let me show you. This is a fingertip. This one right here is a fingertip from one of the giant hands that I have here. I have the whole hand from this one. But you see this little crease right there? Yeah. That's where the fingernail was. Now this is a two, okay. this is what's called a 2D CAT scan where you can see very very fine surface features. Jesse Garant and Associates did seven CAT scans for me. And uh, this is the back of the fingertip. And this right here is a bone. All right, this right here, you see this round spot? Yeah. That's a tendon, and this is also a tendon. Now, this one's black, and this one's white. That's because of the two different colors of the blood coming up here. You see the little hole there? That's a blood hole. That's a blood hole. Now, this is a, this is a good-sized fingertip, but it's only about eight inches long. Now, the hand that it came from is a little over three feet wide. Now, I do have other ones that are substantially larger. And that's this one here. What are giants? How does this earth support things that big? That's, that's the key. I, I can't tell you how it's here. And when I show you the things that, like Typhon, is going to blow your mind. All right, now, th I showed you, th this is a fingertip. Now just take your time and look. You see the fingernail? I, I don't. I see a rock, but I can I see what you're outlining. All right, that think of, just just give yourself a little time to let it sink in. This is actually a finger print. I mean a finger nail. Now this. And you had it DNA tested. Yeah, yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you. So you know. Yeah, okay. no question whatsoever. This little pad right here see that round circle that's where the there's a little pad in between bones so they don't scrub each other that's that this is the vein and artery here this piece right here I had to break off right on the edge of the fingerprint a fingernail and when I broke it off it, like I say this is three feet long from front to back here three feet now, when I broke this piece off, it still has the fingerprints. You see it? You see those two little dots right there? And this strip yeah. going through? That's these sweat pores. This came right off near where the fingernail was. Well, and 
So, and you got it DNA tested and you got it CAT scan. So there's the person who did the DNA testing and CAT scan, what did they say? They said 100%, no question whatsoever. It was um, human DNA. And it was, not only was it, it was human. It was human? Huh? Oh yeah, and it was, my, it was modern human. Here's a report right here. How is it? How are we so much smaller? These, the, the, this size was nothing. The one that I showed you the big finger tip from, I figure he was 160 to 180 feet tall. That's nothing. That's tiny. That's tiny. Well, they found um, on Antarctica, they found huge pyramids with, um, well, huge doors in these pyramid structures. Those aren't huge. Massive Those doors. are little tiny things. This I I well, can show you things. But huge compared to our doors. I mean. Yeah. Well, it, here's the key. Jesus Christ said that Earth is a corpse, and that I'll I'll show you the quotes in a minute. But here's the here's the DNA reports. Now I had three tests on three mud fossil samples. See it. Now, they did PCR extraction. This is serious stuff. This is not their cheap swab. This I drilled into these deep. And I had that 36-inch tip done, the big one. I had a lung done, which is, is um, the thing is almost so perfect you could almost transplant it. And then I had that fingertip I showed you in a CAT scan. That was done. Now, this is what they did from all of these three tests and all of the tests came out positive for mitochondrial human, modern human DNA, but mother's side. Now here's what they did. The products, the PCR products, which is the extraction products, were submitted to Eaton Biolabs for DNA sequencing. And they used the PCR products, or also used it in the DNA sequencing excellent quality DNA sequence was obtained for the 36 inch tip. I drilled right into blood. I know where the arteries are and the veins and I know where everything is on these. So I drilled right into the artery, took out literal blood. So from the 36 inch tip and from the lung, those were both like literally, they were blood. The quality of the third one was not quite as good, the, the mud tip. But here's what it ended up being. 36 inch tip and the lung were both homo sapien, mitochondrial, cytochrome B gene and mitochondrial D loop region. Both of them, homo sapien, mitochondrial. That's the mother side. And this was, this was not a cheap deal. This was, not, this was expensive. It took three months to do it. And I did it because Yale had turned me down. They wouldn't even look at the stuff. And I said, well, I they thought you were a weirdo and then they, this, these guys did it, so that's good. Yeah, well, they, this guy got attacked for doing it. I know he did. He did they did an right. absolutely marvelous job, fabulous job. Absolutely the best. And Why would he get attacked? Well, I know the answer to that. They fired people. They fired, they fired a lot of people for come finding things that they didn't want them to find. That's the academic way. It's denial. Well, they also don't want anything that they think yeah, it has to be within their paradigm, otherwise you're out. What I, what I found destroys academia in every single realm, 100% across the board. I don't care what it is, 100%. And I'm, here's what I'm going to tell you, my research destroys. Geology, 100%. History, 100%. Archaeology, anthropology, all the timelines that we've ever thought were real 150 million years ago this happened da, 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 da. oh that's all wrong human evolution god creation proof of the flood i have absolute 100 percent proof of the flood it was the triassic era and the triassic era was when there was three layers of sediments worldwide everywhere on earth it's called the triassic tri means three layers red bed gray cray clay and black cap and that's when Venus almost hit Earth 
and caused this because and it was also called the great dying everything on earth died and Venus Which they have, yeah yeah well that was from the great flood and Venus was Velikovsky was worlds in collision and he was destroyed by academia for writing it he was number one on a bestseller list 11 weeks in a row number one on the T T New York Times bestseller list and they forced the publisher to withdraw the book yeah I had one of his co-workers or somebody who was actually a student of his who's older now um, I tracked him down and did an interview with him on Velikovsky this was you know I, everything's pre and post COVID but this was like when I was still on YouTube and wasn't censored as much it, very interesting stuff. I, I I would love to dive into what you know more about the Greek gods and why you think they were real. Well, they well, were, I can I mean, tell they you didn't why. Just make up a bunch of gods. They actually were with these people, or I don't know what. They uh, were. Here's, here, I, I'm going to show you exactly. Very very simple. This is Apollodorus. He wrote about 200 B.C., somewhere around here, second century B.C. And he compiled all the works of the great masters, which included Hesiod and so forth, right down. Hesiod was the one who wrote the theogony of all of the ancient Greek gods, and this is basically it. And when I start to read to you, it, I can tell you right now, if I hadn't discovered what I discovered, I would be in hysterical laughter reading this. But here's why I'm not in hysterical laughter. Because here's what I have discovered. And this is on the face of Mother Earth. Alright? And this is written about, in what I'm just going to show you in a second, that Apollodorus wrote in 200 B.C. He wrote about Typhon the dragon, who was right there. Alright, Typhon was the biggest creature that Earth had ever produced. This is his throat. That's his throat. Now here's all his dragon scales running down his throat. How does Earth support that? That's what I don't understand. He was thrown to Earth by, it was talked about that he was thrown to Earth, him and the rest of these dragons. And I mean they're everywhere. They are everywhere. Once you start looking, you, they're just everywhere. Now, this dragon goes all the way across North Africa. There's his head. And I'll show it to you in great de detail. I'll take as much time as you want if you don't understand it. It comes all the way down here all the way across North Africa and here's his tail and it flares out right here. This is his dragon scaled tail. You see the dragon scales? Yeah, it looks like a dragon. No, it, well, it definitely is. and I, it, it, it has a cloaca, which means it's, it's a reptile. A cloaca means they have both sex organs in the same they fit together. They don't, they don't have a vagina and a penis. They have both of them work together. I'll show you that in a second. Now, you see all that different... self -repro -re reproducing No, 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 no. It's just like a bird. It's like a bird or an alligator or any... It, 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 avian creatures have cloacas. It's just a different anatomy. Instead of having okay. a, an anus and a penis or, or a vagina, it has both of those things built together. Now, I'll show you. It's, re okay. it's very easy to see. Now, you see all those colors coming out of there? The reason yep. those colors are coming out is your blood is filled with metals. And this is what the metals are. And it, this is a swale. So the, it, it, the topography dips down a little bit. And all the blood is run into here and has to drain out. And here's where it's draining. Alright, so we're going to go all the way across North Africa. Here's the you can see this is his body. All right, these are the legs. And when I show you what Apollodorus wrote, re, re, uh, wrote, he said it had the thighs of a human. These are the thighs right here, one here and one here. 
a thigh, it specifically points it out, the thighs of a human. Now, here's, here's where he poops, right here, and they both run together. All right, this is where he poops, right out this tube right here. And that's why it's so fertile right here, because it's poop. And this one right here is the urinary tract. It comes down, and they mix together. You see, this one comes through here. That's the urinary tract. It grows things pretty green, and the poop grows things even greener. You see the poop? Yeah, yeah. Now, they mix together. It's called a cloaca. You can look it up. But they come down together, and they mix right together here. And that's when a bird poops on your windshield. You got black and you got white. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, so there's a pooper. Now, we got the thighs of a human. We got the throat up here. Now, here's the deal. You have to pay attention to the details. Understand chemistry, decomposition, all that. He's laying here dying. He's dead, obviously. And all of this stuff up here, this tannish looking stuff, that's just body fluids that run off of a dead, decaying body. They have nothing to do with his body. All this is just fluids. His body is right up here. All right, so this is his throat. Are, are you with me? You seeing what I'm showing? Yeah, I'm, I'm watching, yeah. All right, so all of these are scales all the way down. Now, right down to here is just runoff. That's just runoff of a decaying body. However, in the ancient text, it says that Zeus cut his throat with his great and mighty sword. And here's where that happened, right here. Chikung, right there. Wow. Okay. Now, you see the black and the red? That's yeah. the colors of blood. The black blood is vein blood. Red blood is artery blood. And he just cut them right across. And that's why only right here is the black and the red. Up here is just, it's just like gooey runoff and nasty, slimy stuff that runs off of a dead body. This... Oh, why? Go ahead. No, this right here is totally different. This is blood. And blood... Red blood makes things grow green in the desert. You see that? That's wow. red blood. Okay. Wow. So why did, how long ago was this? And why didn't the body decay like so many other animals that decay in the forest? Well, this was during the Great Flood, I believe. And that was only 3,500 years ago. I know, I know, 3,500 years ago, that's impossible. No, it's not. This was all written about, and even Hesiod, who wrote about this, wrote about this in 800 B.C. That's only 3,000 years ago, and this happened 500 years before that, which was the Great Flood. And the whole earth was covered by by the, the flood because Venus was ejected by Jupiter. And Velikovsky, you said you know about him, right? Yep, yep. All right. Velikovsky recorded this. Every, every single culture on the face of this planet, 100%, 100% said that there was a fiery comet that was ejected from Jupiter and it, apparently it took seven days to approach Earth and almost hit Earth. And as it did, it was brighter than the sun. It baked the Earth, boiled the oceans. Even the Colburn Bible, in the first couple sentences, it says, the destroyer came, boiled the oceans, and destroyed all the trees. And he was known as the Great Destroyer, and the, the, the Nordics had him as the Frightener. And it, it passed just missing Earth and banging into our atmosphere and caused the Earth literally to stop spinning. You've heard it, they said the Earth stopped spinning. It did. It, it hit How against... How did people, anybody survive? Were they, did they get a pre-warning and hung out in the caves? Because they found like whole cities of caves. And it, it appears that some of them realized what was going to happen. 
and they were they were not stupid. These people were just living stupid people like monkeys. They realized what was going to happen, and apparently they scurried up to the highest places they could get on Earth and inside of caves because otherwise they were going to be cooked. I mean, cooked, literally cooked, by this this heat coming down from the skies. Then, in addition to that, once the Earth it actually literally changed the axis of the Earth. That's why we're twisted a little bit. And it stopped the Earth from spinning, as in, I think it's in Joshua or somewhere, and he told the sky to stop spinning, and it did. Well, it did. And every culture on Earth had the same story. Now, some of them had the story that the Earth stopped for a day. Some of them had the story that it stopped for three days. And it was three one day of never got dark and then it got dark for a whole day and other ones had three days of darkness and three days of lightness and nobody could ever explain that. Well, I can tell you why. It's because the ones that were on the equator where the the, the closest to the sun, it's like, it's like how you have, the, I was in Alaska when I was in the army and up there you have the midnight sun. It's because of the twists of the earth. When it twisted the Earth, the half of it stayed. You know, you follow what I'm getting at. Half of it yeah, stayed. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening. Yeah. yeah, I think people can follow that. Okay, so, so very. In, okay, so how does this tie? To, it's just weird that there was this massive dragon. How does Earth support that? I guess we don't know yet. We don't You're know. I have no. I cannot. I, just, I have no explanation for that whatsoever, other than the ancient text said the monsters on Earth grew so enormous that they ate everything that man could provide, then they ate the man, people, then they ate each other. That's what was written. Now, okay. and, then, and then Zeus, who was the god of this solar system, dispatched Venus from a literal vagina. It's on, on Venus. I mean on Jupiter. Has a, has a vagina. And out came Venus to do its bidding, which was to destroy all of the of the creatures on Earth. Now he had given Prometheus a warning to tell Deucalion, who was actually Noah, to build a chest to survive this onslaught and to carry on humanity. And Noah did, or Deucalion by the Greek. I can read you out of Apollodorus all of this stuff. It's, um, he had written, it's the same story as in the Bible, only it's toned down in the Bible. This is just off the charts. Like I said, I would be hysterical laughter if I didn't realize a 1,200-mile dragon was here. And that's so, and, and you and you believe this is there because you've gotten done the DNA tests and this CAT scans and all that, so that you realize that these were actual beings. So, why do you think, besides the writing, because the writing in books and stuff about the Greek gods, um, you could say, okay, those, those are stories. How that? What made you think, okay, this isn't just a story. This is real. All right, here's. I, I'll tell you exactly why. Let's go to Apollodorus 1.6.3. All right, I just showed you what what um, Typhon looks like. All right, you saw him, how big he was. Mm -hmm. All right, now, maybe you didn't see the little details. Here's his red flared eye. Here's his eyeball. And it's all red flared, flashy, coming up like that. You see it? Yep, yeah. Now, here's his unkempt hair and flashy, feathery stuff. You can see his head. You can see it. No, there's no question. Now, now this here is the little fluty stuff they show on the dragons in, in China and places like that. You see? Running down the side. Yep, yep. All right, here's his throat. All of this is not him. This is just runoff. This cut is where Zeus cut his throat. Now, Wait till I read you what it says in Apollodorus. This is going to freak you out. This right here is what he was spitting out at the fish that he was attacking. 
this is the t is is the fiery venom that comes out of dragons. You see it? Oh, that, that, this whole black thing coming down here. Yeah. And he's hitting this fish right here. You see the fish? The fish was big too. You see that? That's that's a gigantic fish. That's his fin up there. This is his body. Do you see it? Yeah, I can see it. All right. So he's spitting this stuff down on the fish, trying to kill it. And it's hitting his fin and just dissolving his fin. And it actually dissolved his scales. And you can get right down in here and see the blood vessels, the arteries, the veins, the capillaries. And you can even see the lymphatic system. These are all arteries. They feed these little blood vessels down and the blood vessels feed the capillaries and the capillaries feed into the veins and the veins suck all the blood back up. You see down here? Yeah, yeah. The blood comes in and ends up going through the capillaries down into the veins. The veins draw the blood back up and these little tiny little tiny fibers here that's the lymphatic system nobody's ever seen this before nobody's ever been able to see this much detail because we're looking at something that's hundred thousand times bigger than us more than that probably and we're looking at yeah, it's, it's just it's just it's it's out of the realm of what seems possible for our planet that's the issue so but unless our whole solar system is different than what we think and i think you brought up velikovsky that, that maybe it is i don't know unless they can live they can fly around our solar system i mean i guess i don't understand well they but, in the in the ancient text even in the bible it says he was thrown to earth along with the rest of his bad guys now where they came from, I can't tell you, but they're all over this earth. Dragons everywhere. You know, the whole east coast of the United States is a dragon. Did you know that? Mm -mm. You see this right here? That's Quetzalcoatl. He runs all the way up the east coast. Here's his head. This is his throat, runs right down here. Here's his beards. They all have beards. Here's his head. He spit right out into the gulf here. This is a, a dead zone. There's nothing can live here. Whatever he spit out was nasty. This is his headdress right up here. You ever see Quetzalcoatl? Uh, you mean the Mexican god? Yeah, he's he's the feathered serpent. Let me see if I can call. It's gonna take me a minute. I got ten thousand, you know, little things to open up. But Quetzalcoatl was the feathered serpent, and he they had glyphs of him everywhere down in South America, Mesoamerica, and he was also called Amaruka, America. And he, as I just showed you, is the entire East Coast. And um, he, here's what they had shown long ago. Uh, well, let's go down to Quetzalcoatl, hold on. Well, this so, should... All right, go ahead. What? I, I, there we go. <clears throat> no. This is how they portray him, eating a giant. Now, if he was the whole East Coast, 
Think of how big that giant would be. And he is the whole East Coast. So pay attention. You see here? Here's his beard. Here's his snaky looking body that runs all the way up. Here's his all feathers on his tail and this big green headdress. Now what do we see here? Identical same creature. There's his head. There's his green headdress. And these are feathers. The reason this is a different color than the red is because red makes things grow green. I, I mean, uh, red blood makes things grow green. That's why you're seeing it green here. Here's his beards. Remember his beards? Yep. Here's his body. These are feathers. Now, feathers make things grow green. You can buy feather meal. Feather meal will make things grow green for a very, very long time. Let's follow his body all the way up to where it had all those flared looking feathers. Well, guess what they call it? The Green Mountains. Those are feathers. They look like feathers. <laughs> they are feathers. <laughs> yeah. And that's why they're so green. You could buy feathers. You... Go ahead. Yeah. Have you done any testing on this? on some of these other areas? Um, well, I have some feathers here that came from down there, not quite as big as these. But I, I mean, this stuff is everywhere. You know, and I have people send me dragon scales. I have all kinds. I have so much stuff, it's just beyond belief. Wow. And um, even like, hold so, on. So, can you... I want to get back to these Greek gods, too. Uh, what other evidence that you have of them being real? You okay, know, I'll show all, you the, all the mythology talks about it. You know, how, how do we jump from... I mean, this is, I don't, this is a crazy conversation. This is very interesting. Look at how this. do we look, jump look, look from at this. being stories to... Okay. Check this out. This is on the side of the road, and these this these feathers are three three inches thick. I have a piece here. Hold on. See this? That's the thickness of this feather. How do? And I saw a video, and I think people need to hear this too because I I don't. How does this turn into rock and versus just disintegrate like other animals in the forest? Well, the reason is because of um, what's called fascia facilitated fossilization. That was a paper I wrote in 2015, which and it, it it's, lays it out pretty, pretty good. It's on academia.edu, and it's from 2015. And um, what happened was under, in this great flood, that water was boiling hot. It's just like you took a bunch of creatures and put them into a boiling hot um, solution and, and added a, a lot of extra silicates. That's the key, the silicates. Now, you boil off all the flesh. The flesh goes right off quick when you boil it in this kind of heat which was the whole earth was boiling. That's why I talked about the Triassic era. The red bed, which was all the, where it starts, the red bed was made of flesh. That's the boiled out flesh. Then it went into the gray clay, which was the, the body, other parts, the tendons and bones and all that stuff. They disintegrated next and made another layer on top of the red bed. And then on top of that, the black cap came down, which was all of the fallout from the volcanoes and um, the interaction with hitting our atmosphere, it combusted everything on Earth, burnt everything to a crisp. And the only people that survived were the ones that got way up into the mountains in the caves. And so they weren't burnt as the, as the torch came towards us. I mean, and it, when it hit the Earth, it didn't just hit and bounce off. Anytime you have compression of atmosphere, you have condensation, all right? So when you compress water molecules, they turn into rain. That's what rain is, compressed moisture. 
when it compressed against our atmosphere, it would have been hundreds of thousands of degrees. And the temperature, what was coming out of the sky would have been boiling. It would have been boiling hot. But it would have still been rain. It was just been compressed. Plus, you had all of the fountains of the earth burst. And they, they all of this is recorded 100%. Listen to this now. This is what drives me freaking crazy. 100% of every culture that existed on the face of this planet had dragons, they had giants, they had gods, they had wars in the heavens, they had, all of these things were written as reality. And even in Greece now, they still teach these, like Apollodorus, as history, not as, as you know, myth. It was the, you know, you, I got to tell you something funny. You know how I was making sure that we had the right time set? I had a thing with a guy in Greece who was talking to, we were talking about how they still consider this all real. This was all real stuff. This wasn't fake. And he, he was, we were an hour behind. And that's why I was checking with you because I had two meetings. I had one for Paris and one for Greece. And I was an hour behind on both of them. And I'm thinking, what's going on? They don't change their clocks back for two weeks after us. Yeah, that's the same in Italy. I'm someone that I... Uh, Can you... I, I was... Italy, I, yeah. I'm thinking, these people don't even know where they are. But anyway, it was it was funny. But anyway, um, yeah, it, it, I'll go back to Apollodorus. Let's go Let's go back to that. So the, 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 you're saying that there's groups in Greece that still believe all this. Oh, you? yeah, that, that's absolutely. This is not... They teach it. They teach oh, it in okay. the schools as history, not as as mythology. And I agree with them. Now okay. you you saw you saw a typhon. Now you saw him attacking a fish, right? Yeah. All right. You saw a typhon. How big he was? I'm going to go right to the point. They're talking about Hercules and Hera. You see this Hercules and Hera, and Zeus inspired him with lust for Hera. When he tore her robes and he would have forced her to have sex, she called for help. Zeus smote him with a thunderbolt. Hercules shot him dead with an arrow. And it goes on and on about killing all each other. Now, here's the last part here, right down here. The other giants, Zeus, who was the god, smote and destroyed with thunderbolts. And all of them Hercules shot with arrows as they were dying. Now, here's where we come into Typhon. This is a freaking, this is crazy. When the gods had overcome the giants. Now, remember this. The giants were Earth's children. She bore the giants. And these were the giants that were in the Earth in those days. Two sets of giants. There was giants in the Earth and giants after that when the sons of God went into the daughters of man. These were the giants in the earth. Now, and they were eaten by the giant, by the gods, and held in Tartarus. That's why they were in the earth. That's why the Bible says there was giants in the earth in those days, and then just skips right over that. Well, this doesn't skip anything over it. Now, the gods had overcome the giants, killed them all, Earth was enraged. Earth was still more enraged, and Earth herself had intercourse with Tartarus, who is hell, and brought forth Typhon, who is the dragon we just saw. Now, here's how he's described. He was a hybrid between a man and beast. In size and strength, he surpassed all the offspring of Earth. Now, here's where it gets crazy. As far as the thighs go. He was of human shape. That's the only thing they say was human, is his thighs. So as far as his thighs goes, he was of human shape and such prodigious bulk, he outtopped all the mountains. His head often brushed the stars. And then he talked about it. One of his hands reached out to the west, to the other to the east, and from them projected a hundred dragon's heads. Now, I was read somewhere that Zeus burnt off the heads first. So I can't find those. But anyway, from the thighs downward, he had huge coils of vipers, which is true. I can show you those. 
and when they were drawn out, they reached to his very head, emitted a loud hissing. His body was all winged, unkempt, hair streamed on the wind from his head and cheeks, fire flashed from his eyes. Such and so great was Typhon when hurling kindled rocks, he was supposed to go up and kill all of the gods. He made for the very heavens, he was heading up there to kill them with hissing and shouts, spouting a great jet of fire from his mouth, which you saw. When the gods saw him rushing at heaven, they made for Egypt in flight, being pursued, they changed their forms into those of animals. And you saw the one that he got was the fish. And Zeus pelted Typhon at a distance with thunderbolts and cut him down at close quarters with an adamantine sickle. That's when he cut his throat. Now, then it goes on to stuff I can't, I can't understand because it doesn't make sense. It's a, the rest of it, eh, eh, because it talks about Zeus cutting their tendons out and storing them in a bear skin and all this kind. It's got some crazy stuff. But then it comes down to Prometheus. All right, Prometheus molded men out of water and earth. So he took clay and put a little water in her and made man. And he gave them fire, which unknown to Zeus, he had hidden in a stalk of fennel. So he, you probably know this story, he, he smuggled fire down for the humans and Zeus was not happy. When Zeus learned of it, he ordered Hephaestus to nail, to nail Prometheus's body to Mount Caucasus on this mountain and Prometheus was nailed and kept bound for many years every day an eagle swooped on him and devoured the lobes of his liver and they grew back by night and that was the penalty that Prometheus paid for the theft of fire until Hercules afterwards released him so Hercules came down and said this is enough and he, he let him go and then he says this was this was from Apollodorus he says we'll show in dealing with Hercules later. All right. So Prometheus had a son, Deucalion. Now don't forget, Prometheus made mankind. So he has a son called Deucalion, who is Noah. All right. And I'll show you why I say he's Noah. He he reigned. So he was a king in the region about Pythia, and he married Pyra. Now listen to this. Pyra, his Deucalion's wife, who was Noah, was the daughter of Hermistus and Pandora. Pandora was the first woman fashioned by the gods. This is out of, control, out of control crazy. All right, so Deucalion is Noah. He's married to the daughter of the first woman fashioned by the gods, Pandora, who was fashioned by the gods to be a punishment to mankind. <laughs> The first woman was a punishment to mankind. And that's why Pandora's box, when she opened oh, that okay. up, she released all of the evils on mankind. And the only that's thing... That's the story. That's the story. And it, it's true. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it looks like it to me. Anyway, this is what was written. Now, so this, she was the first woman fashioned by the gods. And she was supposed to be a gift from Zeus to uh, Prometheus, I guess it was, or Deucalion. One, it was one of them. And he said, don't take the gift. Don't take the gift. Don't ever take a gift from that guy. And he took it and he was enamored by, by Pandora and then it all went downhill from there. So anyway, Zeus was going to destroy the men of the Bronze Age. He decided, this is crazy, they were out of control, there's too many giants, too many dragons. So Deucalion, by the advice of his father Prometheus, constructed a chest. So Prometheus knew that they were going to have the flood. So he said he stored it with provisions and he embarked in it with Pyra, his wife. And Zeus poured heavy rain from the heaven, flooded the greater part of Greece. All men were destroyed except a few who fled to the high mountains in the neighborhood. It was then the mountains in Thessaly parted and that all the world outside Isthmus and Peloponnesia was overwhelmed. That's when all of the flood came to the entire earth. 
and Deucalion, floating in a chest over the sea for nine days and as many nights, drifted to Parnassus, and there, when the rain ceased, he landed and sacrificed to Zeus, the god of escape. And Zeus sent down Hermes and said, what do you want? You know, you lived through this, what do you want? And he said, what will you choose? And he said, I will choose to get men. And at that bidding, Zeus, uh, he, at the bidding of Zeus, Noah took up stones, threw them over his head, and the stones which Deucalia, Noah, threw became men, and the stones which his wife threw became women. And hence, people were called, metaphorically, a stone. <laughs> And Deucalion and his children, Pyra, first Helen, whose father, some say, was Zeus. Zeus was with all the women. He was a sexual predator, basically. And second, and it was all kinds of things, and he became, it, it goes on after that. It's just it, totally crazy and insane. So did people see these gods back then? I mean, because they believed them to be real and they worshipped them. So did they see them? Yes. They were out. They were up on Mount Olympus, and Hesiod was the guy that um, was was contacted here. Hold on. Hesiod was the guy that was contacted by the daughters of Zeus. This was 800 B.C. This is Hesiod. Well, they're showing 650 B.C. I. I heard it was 800. Anyway, they got 750, 650, somewhere in there. Now, Hesiod was an ancient Greek poet, they call him. Well, he was a documenter of the history, and he was told exactly what to write by the daughters of Zeus. Zeus was the god. He wanted his, he wanted the, everything, which I just read you, which is Apollodorus, basically. And he generally thought to have been active between 750 and 650 B.C., around the same time as Homer. All right? Generally regarded by Western authors as the first written poet in the Western tradition to regard himself as an individual persona with active role to play in his subject. Now, in other words, he was contacted by the daughters of Zeus while he was out tending his flocks on... on um, Mount, um, I can't remember what it's, Mount uh, somewhere. <laughs> he was, uh, he was out flock, he was out taking care of his sheep. And they okay. came down and they said, we want you to write the history of our father. Uh, Mount Hermon, that's what it was, Mount Hermon. And, um, and he said, I can't write. And he said, well, you'll write, sit down, and we'll tell you what to write. And they gave him a magic rod, and zip, he wrote all this stuff. And he wrote 15 books, I think it was. Or a lot of books. No, I don't, I don't remember how many, but he wrote um, the Theogony, which was all about the gods and how we got to works and days, which is how the average lifestyle of a human being was back then. He was given a documentary of exactly what it was like, how the gods came to be, how the flood came, how Noah was here, and then what happened after that. And the works and days are how hard people had to work just to stay alive. And then it went on, I forget how many he wrote, but all this is about him writing about these, well here's the dance of the muses at Mount Helicon. Hesiod cites inspiration from the muses. They came down and they said, you start writing what we tell you. These were, these were, the muses were like um, personifications of emotions, love and hate and anger and all that kind of stuff. And virtually everything was personified by a god and all of the things all you know I'll tell you it's it's gets crazier and crazier and crazier but um, we're talking about Herodotus it, it does get it is pretty crazy <laughs> this stuff is is really interesting you have hundreds of thousands of followers on YouTube and elsewhere and you your stuff is really popular where can people find it if they're really interested in this dig into what you have because you have you also have 
art, you publish articles, scholarly articles, and research, and all sorts of things. Yeah, I have. Where can, uh, well, go the, ahead. If, here, let me just show you. I'll just show you how to do it. I'll go right here. If I go to academia.edu, all right, and and put my name in Roger Spur, and then you, know, I, I think I got like forty-five papers up there. Now, this is the first paper. Well, this is the one that started me off. Was um, fascia facilitated fossilization. All right, and nobody knew about, nobody even knew about fascia at this point in time. They, it was just thought it was. I I discovered a new body organ. I, I seriously, you see that you were the first one talking about it before they actually brought it forward. Yeah, nobody That's knew about it, and now it's considered the most important organ in the whole body. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. It's yeah. interstitium. Yeah. So I, I said, if not for fascia, you'd be a bag of gushy mixed organs and just will fall apart. Fascia is the membranes that hold you together, and it also creates springs and strings inside of you. The ancients called it tunica, which is like a cloak that wraps around everything. It's, it's a membrane. And, um, and I say that it's a giant system. It's a sheet that wraps around everything, it comes together in one giant system, and I call it a, a silicon network. Uh, anyway, I showed 50 times higher silicon in the skin and area. Here it is right here. Fascia is a tubular, fluid-filled fabric network. Fascia is a tubular, fluid-filled fabric network. And it goes all the way through your entire body. And that's what carries around. Now they call it the fluid-filled highway. But anyway, I have a bunch of papers up here on academia. And I do everything. I have the light research and all this. But here's the skinny on the whole thing. Fascia is instrumental in perfectly preserved fossilization in wet, fine, continuously wet mud. The product can be exact copies of living creatures, flesh, colors, and all. Blood and everything is in there. And then Yale took, took credit for my research. Here's their paper. I submitted all this to Derek Briggs, this guy right here, at Yale. And there's their paper a year later from the paper I just showed you. It's the exact same paper talking about exceptional preservation of oh, soft body bad. creatures. They, they just well, took it. I've, yeah, I've seen a lot of that from universities. That's terrible. Well, this guy, I guess Derek people Briggs. Being people. Yeah, well, I, I gave all of my research to him, Derek Briggs, and, and he's supposed to be the big shot. Well, here, here, here's, here's their touting about this on campus about how they did all this research. Here's how it starts out here. This is October 2016. Mine was from 2015. My CAT scans, my DNA tests, all from 2015. And this is from Yale. Boy, we're so smart. We did all this. And Etikara biota just means, biota just means creatures. Etikara means they gave it a name. And it's all sea creatures because the whole world was nothing but sea. All right, earliest. Now listen to this. This is how bad Yale is, how incompetent the people there are. This is the earliest, earliest community of complex sea creatures lived in a warm, slimy petri dish. Yet we likely wouldn't know about it at all except for the chemistry of the ancient oceans. And this is where that silica comes from. Remember I showed you 50 times more silicon yeah. was found in the, in the skin? Well, that's yeah. why, because it was from the siliceous ooze that came up from the ocean floors. And they know about this, and they say they would never have known about it except for this silicon. So here it is right here. The operation, unusual mechanism preserved impressions of the creatures for soft bodies for hundreds of millions of years. No, it wasn't hundreds of millions. Now, they say it takes its name from a fossil deposit in South Australia. I'm 20 miles from Yale. They could have walked over here and see what I have. And they're saying it was found worldwide. Worldwide, not just there. It's worldwide. It's one layer called the Triassic, worldwide. 
541 million years ago. The creatures themselves were small as a few millimeters, as large as three feet or so, one meter. And they lived in communities on the sea floor. Well, how is it worldwide? If they well, only what parts lived of this do you dis uh, you're disagreeing with parts of it and agreeing with other. They took your research, recreated this, and then changed it to some of the things that they believe or they don't want to have. Out they there. So they they use specific? yeah they oh. used almost literally a hundred percent of my research, but. I told them it was recent, and it is. All my stuff was on the surface okay. of the earth. Nothing was buried. They're saying 541 million years ago. No, it was 3,500 years ago. 3,500, not 541 million. And they say that the whole world was found worldwide. Worldwide. And, but they say it was only on the sea floors. Well, the whole world was the sea floor because the world was one gigantic flood. I, okay, I see it. So basically, they took all your research and just changed the paradigm around it. Exactly. Used all your research as the base. Right. So we're talking about the Triassic era. All right. So the Triassic was the three layers I talk about, was when Venus almost hit Earth. Velikovsky had it all recorded. And I actually have a human footprint in the middle of those three layers. So people were walking around here during the Triassic. No question about that. Now, they want to understand, here's the Yale. These creatures, outright bizarre in appearance, do not resemble any organism alive today. They got this so far wrong, it's unbelievable. They want to understand if anything back then is related to anything there is here now. They say a big part of the answer involves figuring out how the fossils were able to form. I figured it out. It's nucleophilic substitution and invasion. I got all the chemistry done and everything. Now the animals themselves, listen to this, were entirely soft-bodied. No, they weren't. They lived before the evolution of shells, teeth, or bones. Incorrect. Why are tip, which those, they say those are the only things that normally get fossilized. No, that's not true at all. Mud fossils does the entire creature, the entire creature. Now see, here's what they say right here. During this time, they say what, these, the, what the researchers know, this is what I figured out, was that during the oceans during this time were much richer in dissolved silica than they are today which enabled the loose sand. No, it was mud. Here's where they throw in sand. It was mud. I call them mud fossils. They say, oh, it's sand. No, it isn't. It's mud. And it, to create around animals to form rock in over a matter of hours or years. I created mud fossils myself. It took about eh, six months. And I, and I told them that too. So they say it could have happened. Do we have an article... Of, of a woman or a girl that was fossilized into solid rock using silica in 45 minutes. Yeah. Well, she didn't, it's not solid rock, but she was, it was, it was um, transitioned into, to, to, you know, stone-ish material, but not solid rock. Oh, uh, so stone-ish material that would have formed into rock after about six months, but enough so that if she doesn't dissolve and just, Yes. Going yeah. To, now okay. I'm doing I'm doing an experiment right now. I, I I got some silica, and I I got soaking some a couple of mice <laughs> that I caught in the traps, and I got them soaking in the silica, rich waters. But it's so it's cold, it, it, and it's in my garage. It's in the middle of the winter, and I don't think it's it, it's turned solid. But I don't think the mice have turned solid. But I'm just going to leave it there until it's summer and see what happens but they might have turned solid I don't know but here's this is what they're saying it, I, everything I told them they're, they're just saying it could have happened in hours or years instead of thousands of years that it normally takes now listen to this the Etikara ore was rapidly buried by sand during underwater storm events but it's found worldwide underwater storm events rapidly buried that's because it was a worldwide flood they convolute everything and make it sound like some special thing. It's just a worldwide flood, boiled all the creatures, turned all of the red flesh into the red bed, turned the other stuff into the gray clay, the bones and the tendons and all that, and then the heavy-duty black cap came down on top. All right, and then they say 
all of this stuff. The team conducted his research using detailed microscope. This is all my microscope shots. Research was able to measure. Did they use all your pictures too? They didn't. No, I, I, I don't. I don't know what they used. They, I'm sure they didn't use my stuff. You can find this stuff everywhere. But here's the guy. Oh, okay. The paper was co-authored by Yale postdoctor associate Dale Briggs. He's he was the big shot. I, I go to the top guys in the world. I've gone to the top guys for all my research, and every one of them has been a dismal, incompetent failure. And he's, he is the worst of the worst. And he's a, Evelyn Hutchison, professor of geology and geophysics, curator of invertebrate paleontology, Yale Peabody Museum, natural history. He should be out washing windows. All right, and who paid for this? You and I paid for this. Supported by National Science Foundation, Earth Science Federal Postdoctoral Fellowship, grant from American Philosophical Society, Clark Fund, money from NASA Exobiologists, a NASA postdoctoral fellowship, foundations for this and that, NASA autobiologists. And the reason NASA got a hold of Yale, I'm sure NASA got a hold of Yale to do this study because I got a hold of NASA. And I said, you got, you got all kinds of fossils on Mars. Everything that's here on Earth is on Mars, identical. Did you know that? No. Well, we do know that there's enough evidence to show that war Mars used to be a water planet, or a watery planet. Well, let me show you what Mars is, because I sent all of this to, to NASA, and I said, you guys missed everything. The Curiosity rover, I knew all about this stuff years and years ago, and here's what I sent to you. Hold on. Is your mind still okay? No, I'm. I'm following. This is. <laughs> this is interesting for sure. Hold on a second. Uh, Mars, Mars, cool. We get people thinking and looking in different directions and questioning stuff, and that's what it's about. Wait a second. Where's my Mars Morse code? Oh, took a while. All right, and then we also want to do interstitial. Jesus said, the earth is a corpse. Okay, here we go. Get ready. Hold on to your hats. All right. So we've seen all these other bunch of things. Now, this is what's called the Mars blueberries. Now, these little balls are what's called interstitium balls. And they are here on Earth, right here. And here we call them the, the Moki marbles. Now, this is in Arizona, Utah. And the reason these balls are here is because this was skin from the earth, from the titans. And when that skin eroded, what was inside of the skin was these balls. Oh. All right, now this is interstitium. This is what I discovered was the fluid filled highway and the interstitium. And this, they didn't realize it was here. And this is the fabric you can pull this way and pull that way and pull this way and pull this way and it all comes back to where these balls are anchored. All right, those were, that's why these balls are all over the place here. They were the anchors of the skin. This is in Hunstanton Beach, United Kingdom. This is nothing more than skin. And this is the interstitium, which is this stuff right here. And those balls have eroded out of that interstitium and drop down here, and the interstitium itself, which is the bloody flesh, has turned into mud, which is clay. It's mud. All right, so this, and this, and the Moki marbles are all the same as this right up here. And in us, you need a very powerful electron microscope to see that. Now, let's go back to Mars. 
All right, this is on Mars. That's interstitium. Now, the interstitium is that stretchy, gooey stuff that's in your skin. This is skin. This is pinched together skin. This is pinched together. This is stretched apart and stretched apart here. You see it? Yep, yep. You see all the little balls? Those are the same balls as the Moki marbles and the, the Mars blueberries. They're the tough ones. They don't erode. The straps erode and the fleshy stuff erodes. Now, the reason I know for a fact this is on Mars is because Mars it has no water to speak of. And there is absolutely 100% no erosion from water here whatsoever. This is something like somebody sandblasted this, dusted it with a duster. You will never, ever, ever, ever see this pattern of this this fine, dusty look on Earth. It's just impossible. So I know this is on Mars, and I know, and these are called the Mars Morse code. This all came back from Curiosity. This is 2014. And this I sent to NASA. I said, you guys are missing everything. I said, this is, this is skin. And I showed them all the stuff I found. I showed them everything. And I, this one here is the, is the Mars crab. You see that? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. You know what that is? What? Take a guess. You said it's a Mars crab. <laughs> well, that's what they sent back, and everybody made a big joke out of it. Well, guess, guess what it really is? It's an artery. That's huh. an artery. Those are the little blood vessels that go off to service the, the sarcomeres. These are sarcomeres. You see down here? This is where it is right here. These are muscle sarcomeres. You see these cuts in them? And all these little slats going across? Those are the yeah. connective tissues. And a sarcomere pulls itself together, and it needs tons of blood. And that would feed all of this muscle its, its blood. And it, in, up there, it just dried out and just eroded off the blood part. So that's an artery. Now, I have one here in my shop, the same thing as that, basically. Um, but here's what, I'm going to have to go back in. This is probably going to take a second or two to do, but hold on. Uh, While we're waiting, where can people follow you? Oh, Mud Fossil University on YouTube. That's the best. I, I post virtually every day. Okay. And, yeah, Mud Fossil University. And Mud Fossil is all one word. Now you got to come up and you got to subscribe and you got to keep coming back to check. I do it every, almost every day, and they've got me really in trouble there. You know, they they keep me sort of on the sidelines. Well, you, you know, do have hundreds of thousands of viewers, and there's a lot of people that follow you. Well, yeah, but I don't get a lot of hits. I don't get a lot of views. And the only ones that are, 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 are following me, they're, they're, they're coming after me because something, something's going on there. I don't know what it is. And even I, I work with YouTube. They, I work, I have a, you know, I guess you get so many people, they, they give you an advisor. And he told me, he says, it's like somebody doesn't want you to be seen. And, and I don't know what it is, but anyway, it's one of those things. I'm YouTube, Mud Fossil, all one word, university. And um, like I say, just about every day. Now, this is the muscle sarcomeres. Now, don't forget, there they are right there. Remember what they look like. It breaks down here, slats going all the way across, blood servicing in copious quantities. Now, what does a sarcomere look like? That's a sarcomere right there. They erode along these lines. And the red stuff runs out, but the, the white stuff stays. That's exactly what a sarcomere is. And that's exactly what I just showed you in the muscles. 
right there. You following me? Yeah, I'm following. Okay, so we're good on that. Now, here's a, a here's a bone muscle tendon that I have here in my shop. This is what it looks like. This is the bone. Now, right there, that that pin pins this tendon. This is the tendon to the bone, and then the muscle comes. Now, here it is in colorized. A little better, you can see it. The bone, we don't care about. The bone's back here. What we're seeing is the tendon. No color to the tendon. Is there no muscle to speak of? This is where the muscle starts. You get a lot of tendinous material, but you got all, all muscle coming, and then by the time you get out here, it just falls apart because it's into the sarcomeres. All right, does that make sense? I think so, yeah. All right, so just to be sure you understand, that's the bone. You have to be attached to the bone with a tendon. Then you t a tendon attaches to a muscle. And the tendon is tough as hell. It's nothing but toughness. And here's the, what they think. Listen to this. Remember, the bone would, would have just dissolved in this hot, salty, siliceous waters. And the bone and the muscles just dissolve as well. But the tendon is a different. And I can show you something right here. Look at this. Millions of years in one picture. No. That's a day or so while the creature was dying. You see what I'm saying? That right there is the tendon. Remember I showed you the pin? Yeah. yeah. Here it is right there. That pin came out from a bone, which would have been here, which is gone. It just dissolved. And this was where the, ten, uh, the muscle has also dissolved, the abrupt transition. And this is all that fibrous stuff. That's, that stuff doesn't dissolve. That's fiber. It's very, very, well, there's almost no muscle whatsoever in there. A tendon is just nothing but strappy toughness. And they say that's millions of years in one picture. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, oh, we all know this. We all know that. Everybody knows this. No, we don't know anything. We know so little. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And it's, it's forced unknowingness. It's not because we don't, we can't know it. It's because we're not allowed to know it. Which is really interesting that we're not allowed to know these things. It's just, I, I don't know. Maybe it throws people into disbelief on everything, and they don't want, they don't want to lose that. Well, here's here's here's, here's what just you got to even consider. question things. I mean, I don't know what to believe about what I'm looking at. Being honest, you know, I got to look at it more. But the fact that they won't even let us question things is what bothers me. Well, I have been suppressed in literally every venue. Now, let me show you something. This is my channel, Mud Fossil University. All right, and I, they, they, they got me down here. I get a couple thousand hits, a thousand, two thousands, you know, but I'm showing stuff that you would think would be pretty interesting. Like the stuff in space, you see what I'm showing right there? Yep. That's a heart. It's in space. They're all over space. Everything in space is a body part. You think wow, I'm kidding? I don't even know what to think about some of this stuff. This is just incredible. So they can follow you at Mud Fossil University. Do you also, on YouTube, do you also have... Um, well, yeah, no, 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 wait, wait. Mud Fossil University is the only place, and it's YouTube. Okay, so it's just YouTube. So, and then you also have some articles up on uh, academia.edu. Uh, okay, and so I can do a link to both of those so people know where to find you. This has been really a very interesting conversation. I really appreciate you taking time and walking through this with us. Um, very interesting. I, I suppose I could probably we could probably spend ten hours on this. Oh, we could spend I, more. We could spend weeks on this. I got so um, much more. But, I have so much more, Sarah. You couldn't even possibly imagine, and it relates. Well, this at least. Go ahead. Go ahead. It relates. Well, it relates, no, it relates to the to, speed of light. It relates to the expansion of the universe. Then none of that stuff is true. Speed of light slows down, speeds up. We can do that all day long. Very simple. And that I've been dismissed by Fermilab. When I, when, you, when I tell you how bad things are, this is Fermilab. We pay them billions of dollars. 
a year to look for these particles and they have found them they don't know where they come from I know where they come from because I found them too and here they are right here I'll show you in a second and I'm not allowed to speak to them they told me never to contact them again Well, that's funny. It's terrible. It's really a disgrace. Here's the, I just showed you what Fermilab shows. Those are the same particles. What are they? What are we looking at? All right. The black particle right here is a muon. All right. That's the smallest particle that exists that has mass. This is an electron neutrino. And that is exactly what I just showed you from Fermilab. You see him? Yep, yep. All right. Now, and then they talk about these being the smallest particles that exist. And I contact them. I said, I found your particles. Here they are right here. You see it? The black with the glowy edge around it? Yep, yep, yep. The black yep. with the glowy edge around it? The glowy what one? What they say? And the black, the black can get big and I mean, the black can't change size. The white can get big and small. So what we did was we sent them through a venturi, which means we accelerated that light. Light is a particle and a wave. All right. They say it's a particle yep. or a wave. No, it's both because the particle has a big magnetic field surrounds it. So its magnetic field has to push through every other magnetic field. So it creates this glow. Now, we accelerated it into a Venturi, which is right here. When we did, the particle itself rocket ships forward faster than the speed of light, much faster, and then exploded at the Venturi and created fission and fusion. Fission means mm -hmm. when you break a particle apart, and then when it comes back together, it's fusion. We created that. I'm not allowed to speak to, to, to uh, anybody. I've tried them all. I even went to the University of Geneva in Switzerland for particle physics through Coursera. And I interacted with them. I showed them all this stuff. And I, because they were getting nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And they never are going to get anywhere because they're starting with gigantic. This is 1,823 times smaller than the particles they're working with. We're working with light, they're working with protons, huge huge things and just get nothing more than trash when they hit their particles all they have is debris we're seeing the smallest particles that exist right there and and there they are and we split them created fission and fusion who's we me and rod warren just rod warren is uh, he was the one that actually came up with the design of the venturi but he didn't know what he had he just did it by accident and he, this is all done with a cell phone and and a couple of nails. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Huh. And huh. It, it squirted it down into the Venturi and created this. Now, I went to the University of Geneva in Switzerland. I showed them all my stuff. And I said, we're taking pictures of this with CMOS. They said, you can't take pictures with CMOS. It will destroy the CMOS. I said, no, we're working with light. You guys are working with big heavy particles. They're working with radioactive stuff. When you, do you know if you work over there, you have to wear a badge. You can only stay in there for so long. Whenever they smash their particles, they have radioactivity. There's no radioactivity here. We're working with light. So we can see the particles. We see them split and come back together. You know what they ended up doing? And I plus, I said, you got to focus. I said, you guys aren't even focusing. They're just sending them around, 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 trying to hit them head on. They would send 100 billion particles, 100 billion, and they would be really surprised if 25 of them would actually hit. Every one of ours <laughs> hits. Every one. So because you're focused. Yeah, you're because focused we're focused. Which is hard so to I, do I, when it's that little. I said you got to focus huh. and you got to use CMOS to see because they were using what's called charge coupled devices. You ever hear the observer effect? where you look at yes. something and it changes, it doesn't change. They're putting something in there to extract energy. They're putting something in there that changes it. It doesn't change by itself. We use CMOS. Oh. CMOS means that you wait outside and whatever comes away, you pick up. That's what CMOS does. 
And I said, you have to use CMOS. You can't do what you're doing. You're changing the outcomes every time you look. You know what they did? And I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I worked with the people right there with CERN and Fair, uh, not Well, I tried to work with Fermi, Don Lincoln. He was unbelievable. And he's the one told me, don't ever contact us again. I said, I found your particles. He's the one that wrote this ad. He's the one that wrote all this stuff. Here it is, Don Lincoln. Want a phrase to find? Have a question? Email us. He told me stay so late. emailed him and then he told you to leave me alone. Well, we went back and forth. Kid. I kept saying, no, Don, no, 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 you're just an idiot. He called me a tinfoil hat guy, stay away and never come back. Don't ever contact us again. He's spending billions and billions of our dollars to find what I found 10 years ago. And he refuses to examine. Uh -huh. This is the kind of stuff that pisses me off. Well, it's to too bad. Well, I think it, it, it's too bad that they won't look at it. They, they have uh, arrogance and an attitude, so they won't look at anything that comes from people that aren't of their caliber or some weird thing or it's outside it, of their It's worse than that. Time. It's worse than that. They are siphoning money from the society. They are fi just filling their pockets with grants. The more confusing they can make it, the more obtuse and mysterious and whoa we're getting somewhere now we're, and you see this every day every single day you're going to see they're getting closer and closer to coming around to what i said they know they know <laughs> I, i'm right i am right and there's no question I just, right. it's absolutely fa fascinating what you're talking about and I, this stuff is even more fascinating to me than oh, even this the gets, mud floods well stuff. you you know that so, they just uh, spent billions and billions of dollars with this web telescope and the hubble telescope they can't see that stuff there's no way in the light the lights accelerates light slows down this the, the vacuum of space is nowhere near a vacuum you want to see what's in space i'll show you what's in space this is what they think they can just plow through without hitting anything and the light never slows down. That's what space is. They can't find this. They have no idea that the stuff is there. This is what NASA... What is it? This is all the magnetic fields. This is all the magnetic fields that are in space. These are planets spin and they create these magnetic fields. They call it the, the okay. um, um, gravity waves. These are real. This was done again with a cell phone. With a cell phone. Here's what they got. Whoops. Here's their big fancy. <laughs> this is all they can show is this. <laughs> it's, it's some doodle they do. It's got the black wow. ball. And it's got the white ball. And they show all the, they know what I. They know what I'm doing. Now, trust me. They know exactly what I'm doing. Because my... I changed everything. I changed everything. This, this is my theory right here. Dipole electron flow theory. I just showed you the black ball and the white ball. That's them right there. They understand. But they can't speak about it and keep their jobs, first of all. This is the only thing that exists is the black and white balls. Two of them together make a gluon. Two of these together make the photon, which I was showing you before. That's it. That's yeah, the only yeah. things that exist. And if you take 1,823 of these and add them together, you end up with this. Right there. That's what a photon is. The black all goes to the center and all the white, glowy, burny stuff surrounds it. Well, that was a lot of fun talking to Sarah. She's really nice. And uh, I hope to do several more with her. She is very, very engaging and interested. And she asks a lot of good questions. And, and um, so hopefully we'll be doing some more. All right. Thank you. I love you all.